Hey guys, welcome to Discovering the Narcissistic Father. I'm Sid, and in today's video, we are going to be discussing how narcissistic parents separate the siblings, their children. They do not want peace, they want chaos. So we're going to discuss that and talk about that today. Um, if you do not know, I come from a narcissistic household. I have several brothers and sisters, and there is chaos among us. So one thing I want to point out is this doesn't happen in every single toxic household or narcissistic family household. Um, everybody's situation is different. I've met people who have narcissistic parents and the children have actually grown up and bonded. <clears throat> the chaos has actually bonded them together, has helped to bring them together. They were able to come together, recognize, hey, mom and dad are toxic or mom is toxic, dad, dad is toxic. We came from a toxic household. Let's rebuild our relationship together or they've always had a strong relationship since they were younger and they kind of have a common ground on where they stand with their parents. But I've also seen it where the chaos separates the children and even though all the children are growing up in the same household with the same people, everyone is on is in their own world, on their own island, trying to figure out how to survive. So in normal households, the parents are going to encourage the siblings to get along, be best friends, look out for each other. Um, they're going to encourage that unity. In narcissistic households, they're going to encourage separation. They're going to encourage chaos. They're going to encourage anything but unity. Separate, divide and conquer, if you will. So that is their goal. So if the children are able to come together and be in harmony with one another and actually get along and not feed into the narcissistic's temper tantrums and all their tactics, that's not going to work for the narcissist. So remember, the narcissist wants to use you as supply. They are on a desperate need for supply, narcissistic supply. And narcissists love to use their children because they feel like their children are them. They feel like their children are just little versions of them that they have complete full access to do whatever they want to do with. If you're married to a narcissist, you can divorce them. If you have a friend that's a narcissist, if you work with a narcissist, like you're not attached to this person forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But when you are a child of a narcissist, and you're growing up in that household, you have at least 18 years in that household, unless something crazy happens and you like get adopted by your grandmother or you go into social services or your parents get divorced and you go live with the other parent and you never see the narcissistic parent again. But I'm talking to the people who were raised in a narcissistic household, whether it was separate households and you saw your mom on the weekends and saw your dad during the week or whatever it was, but you had your parent in your life enduring all of that abuse, they are using you for narcissistic supply. And children of narcissists specifically are a unique target because they just feel like their children is an extension of who they are. So they feel like their children are supposed to like what they like, do what they do. They just look at them as an endless supply of that they can control and do whatever they want to do with. So <clears throat> I remember growing up in my toxic home feeling like I did not know my brothers or my sisters. And we grew up in the same household, we were all there, and now we're all adults, and no one has a relationship with no one else. And so I started just reading more into this, um, really asking questions and trying to figure out, do other people relate to this? And basically, from the research that I found and from my own experience, is that the narcissist is going to create chaos as a way to separate you. And basically, what happens with the children is that we are all trying to fight for that love and attention from the narcissist. <coughs> 
So when you're three and your sibling is one and your other sibling is seven and you're just a baby and you're just a child and you're just trying to make it through your day to day life and have a good time. You're, you obviously do, don't understand what's happening to you. But even at that young age, you're being separated from your siblings and you're being taught that if you don't comply and you don't behave in the way that's pleasing to the narcissist, then you're either going to become the scapegoat or you're just not going to be receiving of that love. So in order to receive that love, you begin to look at your siblings and you do this in a subconscious way, of course. You begin to look at your siblings as your rivalry, your enemy, because you're all trying to get love from the same source. And that source is not promoting unity and saying, hey, we can all have love together. But rather, they're pitting you guys against each other and they're making it extremely extremely difficult for you guys to bond so in narcissistic households it's common for the parents to compare you to each other that's one of the ways that they set you up against each other they'll say hey john is getting great grades in school what are you doing in school you know the principal called me again today and now you're gonna you have detention again or you didn't do well on your math test meanwhile john is just doing everything right so when you're seven, you don't understand what's happening to you. So now you hate John or you feel envious towards John because John is receiving this love, this attention, this admiration from your parents. And all you want is the same thing. And <clears throat> you might be doing bad in school because you can't focus because of all the chaos that's going on at home. Or maybe you just learn a different way or you have something else going on. And in a loving home where people actually care about their children and want their children to thrive, instead of comparing, they would never do that. They would try to figure out why their child is not doing well in school. What do you need from me to thrive? They will talk to their teachers. They will talk to the principal. They will get tutors. They will enroll them in after school programs. Whatever needs to happen to help this child be the best that they can be. Not use their brother or their sister against them to point out that they're so much more of a better person because that's what it does it's a jab at your self-esteem and you start to look at it as like you're not good enough you don't measure up to your brother or your sister so now this creates resentment towards your brother or your sister because you feel as though they're receiving the love that you want when really no one's getting love because they're abusing them as well. No one's getting love, but it's painted to you and presented to you in a way that you're going to perceive it as they're getting love and you're not. And so they do this constantly. When it's the scapegoat, everything is going to be your fault. You can never do anything right. I asked you to go in there and wash the dishes and it's taking you an hour to wash the dishes. What's taking so long? How many times do I have to tell you? Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. And the other children are there seeing that. And now it's like, I don't want to be John. I don't want to be Sarah. I don't want to be Ashley. I don't want to be the one that's constantly being picked on. I don't want to be the one that's constantly being bullied on. And you'll see this happen even in small children in like school. If there's one child who's the bully, who picks on everyone, bullies them, berates them, puts them down, the other children will, some of them will join in. And if they don't join in, they will just instinctive, instinctively know to get out of Dodge. Like, I don't want to be that next target. I don't want to be that next person that's being bullied, that's being picked on by this person. So I'm going to stay out of the way. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do and hope for the best. We'll just apply that same type of mentality, but to a household where you reside, where you eat, sleep, and you're there every day. That's supposed to be a loving environment. If you constantly see one of your siblings being picked on, you do not want to be that sibling. You do not want to be the one that your parent is on the phone talking to another family member about. You do not want to be that sibling. So you want to have a relationship with them, but it's a part of you that is trying to stay away from them. And those are the years that you're supposed to be bonding, that you're supposed to be falling in love with your brothers and sisters and getting along with them and building that bond. Because the bond for many of us, the bond that you create when you're a child is going to be that bond that's what's, that's what's going to keep it strong 
when you get older and I'll speak on, more on that a little bit later some people when they're young they don't have a good relationship when they get older they're able to come to terms and some are not but like I said I'll speak on that a little bit later but yes yeah, so that's what happens in these dynamics is that the children are put against each other and when they're supposed to be bonding when they're supposed to be connecting they are seeing each other as threats so they're fighting for attention I'm trying to get attention I'm trying to get loved I want mommy and daddy to pay attention to me and the ones that become the golden child is usually the one that is doing every single thing that the narcissist loves they are trying to be who the narcissist wants them to be so they're doing whatever it takes to receive that praise because they have, are being trained that that's love even though it's not love they're being trained that that's love and it's better than being berated it's better than being talked down to it's better than being blamed for everything it's better than feeling like you're a loser it's better than feeling like you're less than so yeah when you're five when you're 12 when you're 13 when you're 15 you would rather be the child that's receiving some form of praise than the child that's receiving all of the hatred so you fall into these patterns and now your job becomes to keep that up. And usually golden children become narcissists. I have a whole entire video on that and they have an identity crisis. And yeah, but usually golden children become narcissists. They're like little narcissists in the, tr in the making. That's basically what's happening. Um, and unfortunately scapegoats end up with codependency usually those are the outcomes in a narcissistic household but yes the children are usually pit against each other because everyone is in survival mode everyone is doing what they need to do to get what they perceive as love in reality we know it's not love but your mind is perceiving it as love because this is the only thing that you know this is the only experience of love that you have so your mind and subconscious registers that as love even though it's not even meeting the basic requirements you measure that as love so when you measure that as love you're gonna do whatever you need to do to get that because we need love we need what we perceive as love we need that in order to survive it's you need it it's not negotiable you literally need it just like how you need food water you need that so you go into survival mode and now you're doing whatever it takes and you perceive your brothers and sisters as threats i mean if you grew up in you were raised by your grandparents or something then you perceive your your cousins whoever you're in the household with that's on the same level field as you same playing field as you you're gonna perceive perceive that other person as a threat like I said some children bond over this but a lot of children are they don't bond over it it's just everyone's in their own world because everyone is trying to survive how can I get love from my mom and dad how can I get them to pay attention to me and it's an exhausting game that you play every single day to get attention and this is why a lot of children raised by narcissists, they fall, they're easy prey for toxic people. And a lot of the young girls, unfortunately, end up with older guys that take advantage of them because you are on a hunt for love. You are literally on a hunt for love. I saw this quote, I don't want to get it wrong. Um, I actually posted this one on my Instagram too. I am not sure where this quote is from. I know it's from a book. It's definitely not my quote. I'm not sure where it's from. If you guys know where it's from, please leave it in the comment section below. But the quote says, when you are not fed love on a silver spoon, you learn to lick it off of knives. And when I tell you that that hit me like a ton of bricks, I'm going to say again, say it again. When you are not fed love on a silver spoon, you learn to lick it off of knives. It is the truth. Toxic households, toxic parents, narcissistic parents, they set their children up for the worst type of people in the world because you are on this hunt for love. And the only way that you have learned to receive love is to accept abuse. You literally think love is abuse. So you're looking for the same type of love that you receive from your parents because that's what you have been programmed to receive and that's what you think love is. So 
you weren't treated right so now you find people that are just going to create the exact same reality for you it's actually extremely sickening um so yeah what i was <laughs> getting back to my point what i'm saying about um the children is that you become separated and you're just trying to survive you're in survival mode i didn't realize that for probably my whole life up until like <laughs> three years ago i was in survival mode like everything that i did every friend that i had relationships romantic or not were all a part of me trying to be in survival mode and trying to meet other people's needs and trying to cater to whatever idea they cooked up of me in their head and it is so exhausting it is so extremely extremely exhausting and you learn these tactics when you are a child from your narcissistic parent so yeah a lot of people um, do not even know how to bond with their brothers and sisters so getting to the point I made earlier um for me and my siblings, I feel as though we became so separated from each other that even though we grew up in the same household, I don't feel like I know my siblings. And I don't feel like I, my siblings know me. And it's not just me. I can look at the relationships they have with each other and the relationships they have with me. No one is close to anyone else. No one has a personal bond and relationship with anybody else. I see brothers and sisters hang out all the time. And I'm talking about ones that are in school, ones that work, ones that have families who are married. That doesn't stop them. They go out and have dinner with their brother and sister. They go to the movies. They actually enjoy each other's company. They call each other on the phone. They text each other. They have a real relationship with each other. They really truly know what this other person is into, what they like to do. Um, they're close. And I have not experienced that type of closeness and that type of intimacy with my siblings. We have no relationship. If we come around each other, it's a very forced situation. It's because there's some type of event, family event, that we all have to be present for. And so we come and we put a smile on and, you know, we give hugs and stuff. But if I had to answer personal questions about my siblings as far as, like, what's their dream job? what do they like to do in their free time i would literally have a hard time and these are people i have grown up with that i have known my entire life and i would struggle to tell you their career choices i would struggle to tell you what they look for in a partner i would struggle to tell you what their favorite color was oh my gosh this is like <laughs> so terrible but it's actually extremely true it's extremely accurate and I feel like it's because we have no idea who we are in relation to each other and that opportunity was blocked it was discouraged throughout our entire childhood and I feel as though when a bond was being created there were dynamics happening underneath there was manipulation tactics there was gaslighting happening to discourage any form of a relationship because we have backbiting we have gossip we have flying monkeys doing the dirty work of the narcissist that is doing whatever they can to keep any form of relationship from thriving and if you are in a situation where there's a narcissist I mean where there's I'm sorry there's always a narcissist <laughs> but if you're in a situation where there is a scapegoat and um a golden child good luck because that golden child will always side with the narcissist because they do not want to become you their entire goal especially when they're younger when they get older they're gonna realize like damn the scapegoat is better than the narcissist i mean better than being the golden child because most golden children become narcissists but in that younger stage, they don't want to become you because they see the hatred that you're receiving. They see how you're being talked down to. They don't want to be you. So they are going to help the narcissist be the narcissist. They're going to be that willing, ready supply because they're trying to, it's a survival tactic. They're trying to avoid becoming you. So it becomes extremely difficult to have a relationship if it's just you and that golden child and you're the scapegoat. That's really, really unfortunate. But yeah, so I realized that I don't know my siblings at all. My siblings don't know me. 
Uh, we cannot relate to each other. Uh, we can discuss, even when it comes to the trauma that we experience, we all have different perceptions on it. Some people are like, what trauma? What, what, tox what are you talking about? Who's toxic? What? Like, so still confused. And we're all adults. So still completely confused. And then others, while they may have picked up on the abuse, they may have a different perception of it. They may not think it was that bad. You're not remembering it correctly. Yada, yada, yada. It's just not the same. So, and bonding over trauma isn't healthy because then you have a trauma bond. What do you have when you've healed from the trauma? What do you have when you no longer want to discuss trauma 24-7? Where is the actual, real, genuine relationship? It's not there. And I just think that that's crazy because ultimately the plan worked. The plan was to keep us separated and that's exactly what happened. Like it worked on us. Like I said, some people, they bond over the trauma, but for others like myself, it worked. We have no relationship with each other. And, and you know what the thing is? I mean, I do have a couple of siblings that are narcissists that I'm just like, stay over there. Like I'm not itching to have a relationship with you, but the ones that are not narcissists, it's it's very difficult. It's very difficult because so much energy and time would have to go into literally rebuilding the relationship and the intentions would have to be there. So we would first have to both recognize why we don't, we would have to recognize that we don't have a relationship. Then we'd have to recognize why we don't have a relationship. And then we would have to rec we would have to put like specific intentions in place to overcome not having a relationship and that's where the difficult part comes in because some people are still in survival mode I know me I'm still trying to recover from lifelong abuse I'm still trying to figure it out I'm still on my own healing journey and the crazy part about it and I can't even believe that this is the conclusion I came to. The crazy part about it is that I actually feel like our healing may be rooted in us not having a relationship. So hear me out. Sometimes when you grow up in a narcissistic household, you identify with one role or another maybe you're a flying monkey and now you're no longer one maybe you're the scapegoat and you're trying to shed that and move on whatever it is you identify with some role the narcissistic family household is set up so that every single person has a role every single person plays a role separately everyone has their designated role whether you chose it or not it's your role and that's the role you play in the family. So sometimes when you grow up and you no longer are forced to be in this environment and you're able to venture off into your own and you recognize, hey, something's not right. Okay, I grew up in a narcissistic household. I was abused, yada, yada, yada. I'm on my healing journey. I'm in therapy. I'm doing meditation. I'm unlearning all the programming. I'm reprogramming. I'm reparenting myself. And you start learning all these beautiful ways to figure out who you are and become who you are. And you go back into that environment that made you sick in the first place you suddenly slip back into your original role. So if you were the scapegoat and you're heavy on the codependency, you're fine as long as you're not around the people who made you codependent. But the moment Thanksgiving comes up or it's Uncle Joe's birthday or you just have to be around those set of people, you suddenly slip back into a codependency role. Are you guys following me here? Le leave me a comment if you, if you hear me, if you understand what I'm saying. You can do so much healing and you can be so far removed from your toxic environment. But something like comes back to life when you go back around 
the people and you're back in the environment that made you sick, that made you mentally ill. And you get around these people and all of a sudden it's all back as if you did no work. It's right there. And it happens su in such a subtle way. It's not even like a, a like, it's not like majorly in your face. It just kind of happens and you find yourself doing things and like going backwards in your healing and it doesn't happen to everybody so maybe you don't relate even when you put up boundaries and even when you try to be as self-aware you just find yourself kind of slipping because you just kind of go back into that role so what I'm getting at is because that may happen to you if you do relate to this it's almost like the best thing to do is to stay away from them even though you desperately desire a relationship now I'm not talking about the toxic people so I know a lot of people have gone no contact with like toxic family members I'm not telling you what to do or how to do I'm saying that if you have siblings that you realize you don't have a relationship with because of unfortunate circumstances that you had no control over because you realize now that you were pitted against each other that everything that happened to you was to discourage a relationship with you and your siblings and you now understand that and now you're like okay what would it be like as an adult to have a relationship with my sibling that I basically don't even know because of the trauma that we both endured and now you're trying to have a relationship with them but you realize when you go back in their space and you're back in their environment you regress in your healing that's what I'm getting at and so the sad truth the sad truth that I that I kind of came to and it can change it can change it doesn't have to be this way forever but where I am right now in my journey is that I feel as though we are better off in our healing spaces not being around each other because I feel like just be just in the same way that they activate my regression of healing I probably activate theirs too because I played a role in it too and we're all innocent I'm not blaming anybody we're all innocent these roles were put on us these were survival tactics I'm not blaming anybody I'm saying that we all played a role unconsciously and we did it to survive and so when they come around me I'm triggered and when I come around them I have to accept that I'm triggering them and maybe I'm making them regress in their progress as well. And so even though it's not our fault and it sucks so much that we're not close, it's like maybe for us to heal, we have to remain not close. And maybe somewhere in the future, we'll get to a place where we can kind of like come back together and have a relationship. But I truly, truly believe that for some narcissistic for some children who were raised in narcissistic households that it's just like as much as it sucks you you have to accept it you have to accept it especially too also they may not be in a healing journey they may be in delusion and feel like nothing ever happened they're fine there's nothing wrong with them so it's gonna activate whatever you're experiencing even more because you're trying to set boundaries and heal and change and this person is still stuck in that same survival mode and still displaying those same harmful behaviors and so you can't be around them even though they're not a narcissist they just have toxic traits and you can't be around them because it's going to activate you and it's going to trigger you and it's going to bring you mentally and emotionally back to where you were that is some that's some stuff man that's some heavy some heavy stuff to accept because it's like there's so many relationships that are just cut off at the knees that have no room to grow they have no room to to make any progress they have no room to blossom into anything beautiful because at such a young age they were just like severed you know and now trying to regroup it's just like it's such a huge loss and I'm at a stage where I'm realizing like so much energy has to go into my healing 
that I literally just do not have the extra mental space that it would take to put in the the work to have a relationship with them. Like it would just take so much energy for me that, yeah, it's just going to put me back where I was. It's not going to help me progress in any way. And so I have to let it go. And that freaking sucks. That freaking sucks because it makes you feel like the narcissist won. They got exactly what they wanted to get. And now there's nothing that you can do about it. So let me know if you guys can relate to this. Those of you who have bonded over the trauma, kudos to you. There's a, there's a lot of people that was able to come together after the narcissistic abuse and they were able to sit down and have a conversation with their siblings and realize, hey, I actually like this sibling. We actually get along. We actually share some common interests and they can like rise above the stuff that happened to them the abuse they can build a beautiful bond a beautiful relationship some of us aren't so fortunate and the the rivals just they just keep going you know and so yeah that's my experience just sharing it with you guys um yeah please leave me a comment let me know if this is you follow me on instagram at discovering the narcissistic father and i will talk to you guys soon bye